it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, staying in the theme of uh, terpenes, the same monotherpene. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Nicole Leffering from uh, Manchester Institute of uh, Biotechnology. Um, Nicole uh, got her master's and PhD uh, from uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, where she did her PhD in a group of Professor Willem van Berkel on uh, on flavored proteins and involved in vitamin C biosynthesis. And after her PhD, Nicole moved to uh, Manchester to do her postdoc, and this is where we had a, a chance to meet and overlap during our postdocs for Nigel Scriven um, at uh, at Manchester. And uh, Nicole is now a research fellow at the Future uh, Biomanufacturing Research Hub there, uh, where she focuses on a rational engineering and directed evolution uh, of uh, designer enzyme activities um, and the application in um, the first uh, different uh, pro product synthesis. Well, thanks, Anya, for the uh, introduction. So we've already heard about um, terpenoids in this uh, seminar series. So I'm gonna continue on that theme and I'm gonna talk about biocatalyst engineering and synthetic biology platforms for monoterpene production in, in E. coli. Um, so monoterpenoids are a structurally and chemically diverse group of natural products. They are especially rich or especially found in, in plants. They're the major constituents of essential oils and conifer resins, for example. And I'm just showing a couple of examples here of um, monoterpenoids. So, for example, limonene, which we find in citrus fruits, uh, linalool in uh, lavender plants, pinene in fir trees, and cineol in, in eucalyptus. And these molecules, they're um, really industry um, attractive. They're widely used as flavorings and fragrances. I think we're all familiar with, with menthol uh, in, in mouthwash and pinene in these, these car, refresh, car air refreshness. But besides smelling nice, these compounds also have microbial, my, micro, antimicrobial properties. So that's why we find them uh, in cleaning products. And they're also used as precursors for um, all sorts of pharmaceuticals, bioplastics and um, high density jet fuels. Um, so we've already heard about the pathways of terpenoid biosynthesis in nature. Um, so there's two pathways as we heard in the previous talk by, uh, by Ricardo as well. So I call this one the MVA pathway, which starts at acetyl-CoA, and it has bivalinate as the um, key intermediate, and ultimately re results in this C5 isoprenoid building block isopentanyl diphosphate, and this pathway is present in all higher eukaryotes. So the second pathway, which I call the MEP pathway, starts at pyruvate and glyceraldehyde-3 phosphate, and has methyl erythritol phosphate as the key intermediate and results in the um, C5 building block, dimethyl, um, got the name, DMAPP C5 building block. So, and then there's this isomerase here, which interconverts these two compounds. And this is important because these two building blocks are used by the, uh, in different ratios by the um, prenyl transferases and ultimately result in the different terpene uh, substrates. So my work most, mostly focuses on um, the monoterpenes, and for that we uh, have the GPPS substrate, which is 10 carbons long and consists of one unit of IPP and one unit of DMAPP. But for example, to produce sesquiterpenoids um, or F from FPP, we need two units of IPP and one unit of DMAPP uh, and so forth. So by uh, adding more C5 units, we can get bigger and more complex products. So, and then finally, which is what my work really focuses on is um, the terpene cyclases or synthases. These enzymes, they catalyze the high energy cyclization reactions of these linear isoprenoid precursors into di the diverse hydrocarbon scaffolds. So a couple of years ago now, uh, we set out to um, develop this plug and play monoterpenoid hydrocarbon platform in E. coli. Um, and like I said before, plants are especially rich in monoterpenoids. So we employed a library of different monoterpene synthases from a variety of plant species to be able to generate these different um, molecules. So they're both linear cyclic as, as well as bicyclic and all originating from the same GPP substrate. 
So in our engineers E. coli, we will have um, a heterologous MVA pathway as well as the native MEP pathway um, generating this FPP precursor from simple sugars. So the way we did this was by using a dual plasmid system where we've got on module one, um, which produces the C5 isoprenoid precursors, and then a much smaller second unit, which has a GPP synthase and then an interchangeable terpene synthase. So we then co-transform these plasmids into, into our E. coli cells, which we then grow on simple sugars, uh, glucose, for example, as the carbon source. And then we add an organic overlay because these compounds uh, are highly volatile. And we then analyze them by GCMS. And um, all of the product profiles shown in this presentation have been determined using this method because it's um, a very rapid way of determining product profiles of, of the different enzymes without having to purify um, your enzymes. So when we introduced um, about 20 different uh, terpene synthases from plants, we were able to generate over 30 different monoterpenoid products from glucose, including all of the ones shown, all of the ones shown here in, in this figure. And for some of them, we were able to get uh, really quite decent titers, um, but for others, the titers were really quite low. And we think that this is because these plant enzymes do actually express quite poorly in, in E. coli. And in addition to that, um, these enzymes produce product mixtures rather than pure single products, which is what, what we were after. So to be able to understand why these enzymes produce product mixtures, um, we're gonna have to have a look at the, at the um, reaction mechanism of these enzymes. So here's the crystal structure of a, a famous um, monoterpene synthase. It's limonene synthase from, from spearmint. It has uh, two domains. So in green, we see the class one terpene cyclase domain, which contains the active site. And this is where the reaction takes place. And then there's also this orange domain and um, we don't really know what it does. So in terms of the reaction, it's... Um, it's a high reaction mechanism with lots of opportunities for um, the reaction going um, in different directions. So the initial step, which is the ionization of the general diphosphate substrate is the same in all enzymes. So it's metal dependent. And then we arrive at the first um, intermediate, which is the geronal cation. But this intermediate is highly reactive. It can deprotonate to form myrcene. It can react with water to form geraniol, or it can react further. Um, via the linalyl cation, it can cyclize into the first cyclic intermediate, the alpha terpenal cation, which again can react um, to form more simple monocyclic products, or it can react further to the more uh, complex bicyclic uh, products. So each of these carbocations can undergo a range of cyclizations and isomerizations, and also a variation of termination reactions. So after this initial ionization step, what the enzyme does is actually little else than providing um, like a productive template for the carbocations to react in. And I always like to compare this um, to an ice cream scoop, which basically molds um, the ice cream into a ball. Um, so because these plant enzymes um, express poorly in E. coli and because we get a lot of products uh, produced, we started looking into other organisms that might be able to produce monoterpenoids. So, um, our next sort of source of these enzymes was, was bacteria. Um, we did um, some bioinformatics and in the known genomes, we found over 2000 hits for class one terpene cyclases. And it has long been known that certain soil bacteria, include, including streptomyces species, are able to produce these terpene derivatives, 2-methyl isoborneol and, and geosmin. And these two molecules are responsible for this musky smell of, of wet soil that I'm sure everybody has smelled. Um, but more recently, in the last decade or so, uh, people have detected other terpene synthases in, bacteri in bacteria, including several sesqui and diterpene synthases. And then amongst those, there were also a few of these enzymes that were able to produce monoterpenes. And when I started this project, there were only two of these enzymes known. Um, and Bifunctional linalool neurolidol synthase and a purely monoterpene synthase producing cineol. And then since then, when we started characterizing more of these enzymes, we found that this bifunctionality occurs more in bacterial terpene synthases. We've identified several additional enzymes that are active on both GPP and FPP. So hopefully, uh, once we start looking and finding more enzymes, we'll be able to detect more monoterpene synthase activity. 
So we were lucky enough to be able to determine the crystal structures for the bacterial linalool and sineal synthases. And what's interesting is that these enzymes lack this N-terminal domain that's present in the plant enzymes. So they contain of a single domain only, which is the class one terpene cyclase domain. And that makes them more similar to sesquiterpene synthases, which could hint at a, a, a common evolutionary origin. So when we then started plugging these bacterial enzymes into our monoterpenoid production platform, we found that we got much higher productitis. Um, it's can be seen here in this figure. On the left, we see the bacterial linalool synthase and here the product profile for the plant enzyme, which completely disappears into the x-axis. So the improvement is almost a thousand fold. And we think that is because of the uh, better expression of the proteins. Um, Additionally, to the linalool, we also get some neuronidol byproducts. So, and very similarly for the sineal synthase, again, we found um, higher product profile, higher product titers, although not as spectacular the difference as for the linalool synthase. But what's really interesting for the sineal synthase enzyme is that it produces 95% pure sineal from GPP, where the plant enzymes produce about 60% pure sineal, uh, sineal um, at, at the most. So in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll talk about some protein engineering I've done on, on these enzymes. So one of the target compounds we had from, from the start of this project is, is linalool. Linalool is used as a fragrance ingredient and it's a promising alternative source for biofuels. Uh, but as I, I just showed in the previous slide, the linalool synthase produces both linalool and the unwanted neuridol byproduct when we express it in our E. coli strain. So this is because besides the heterologous GPP synthase we added, um, e. coli itself contains an, an FPP synthase, which is this is, is A gene. Um, so both of these substrates are present in, in the substrate pool and they undergo the exact same reaction in the active site of linalool synthase. So again, we get the initial ionization, which results in the geronal or farnesyl cations, which then I summarize to the linalool cation or the nerolidol cation. And then we get attacked by water, resulting in the final linalool and nerolidol products. So we briefly considered um, sort of producing E. coli knockout strains that don't have this A gene anymore. But even though this gene is not essential for growth, it does really reduce the growth rate. And that's because FPP is used by E. coli as a precursor for um, essential respiratory um, quinones. So rather than removing FPP from the substrate pool, we were thinking, could we maybe engineer the enzyme so that it no longer accepts FPP as a substrate? So what we did was then look into the crystal structure, um, both linalool synthase as well as sineal synthase, and I've overlaid the active sites of the two enzymes here. So the linalool synthase is in green and the sineal synthase is in blue. And you should remember that the sineal synthase only accepts GPP, so the shortest of the substrates, not FPP. And the striking thing about sineal synthase is that it contains four phenylalanine residues in the active site, which really constrict the exocyte cavity, makes it quite small. And three of these residues are um, different residues in, in, um, in the linalool synthase, uh, including a leucine here, a threonine and entocysteine. And then there are a couple of additional residues that sort of line the exocyte pocket in, in linalool synthase that we targeted as well. So when we started this, the first thing we did was make the active site of linalool synthase more like the sineal synthase by introducing phenylalanine residues. Um, now this was not very successful. What we ended up with was mostly um, inactive protein. So then in the second round of mutagenesis, we introduced um, only residues that were only slightly bigger than the originals. Um, and here we were more successful. So we found two variants that had favorable properties. The first one is this leucine 72 methionine um, mutant, where we got an increase in linalool formation and a reduction in nerolidol formation. And then the second variant was this phalene 214 to leucine variant, where we barely got any nerolidol production. And even though linalool titers were, were lower, they were still decent. So next, we wanted to investigate these residues in, in further detail. So here we can see them both um, positioned in the active site and they're sort of positioned at opposite ends and you can imagine that if you make these a little bit bigger the longer um, FPP substrate this is a GPP analog um, would find it more difficult to bind in the active site. So what we did was we introduced a variety of polar and non-polar residues 
And to our surprise, actually, we found that only very few of these variants were showing um, good activity. And that was true for both of these positions. So we were lucky when we introduced the methionine in, in the first instance that that was the variant that um, showed the highest activity. And similarly for the valine 214, there were only really two or three residues we could use to introduce to still end up with active um, enzyme. So only a limited number of residues could be introduced at these positions. And this is where this bacterial enzyme is really quite different from what we know about plant monoterpene synthesis, where you often can mix and match residues in the active site, still ending up with active enzyme, but often producing slightly different product profiles. And this is probably where this promiscuity is coming from in the plant enzymes. So the next thing we did was to create double mutations to see if we could improve um, the enzyme even further. So we made two double mutants, the leucine 72 methionine in combination with valine 214 isoleucine as well as leucine. And both of these variants produced um, had actually favorable properties, albeit in quite different ways. So the first double mutant had a much higher activity than a wild type enzyme, but still with the same level of uh, neroliol by production. Um, but this um, second double mutant had uh, almost pure linalool formation, still lower than the wild type enzyme, but considerably higher than the single mutant. And in this figure here on the right, we, I plotted the um, linalool over neroidol ratio of these um, variants. And we can see that in this, this second double mutant, it's really a combination of the two single mutations. And also we can see that the uh, valine to isoleucine does not really have a big effect on the linalool to neuroidol ratio. So the next thing we did was to um, make sure that these differences in product profile were not the result of changes in the intracellular GPP and FPP concentrations. We wanted to make sure that it really was the enzyme um, that we changed. So to do that, we um, did purify some enzyme and assayed them with excess GPP and FPP. And there we found that the wild type enzyme is actually more active with FPP than it is with GPP. So it really is a sesquiterpene synthase with some promiscuous um, monoterpene synthase activity. So, and then for the, uh, for the mutations, so with the exception of, of this failing 214 isoleucine mutant, all variants now show a reduction uh, of the activity or towards FPP over GPP. So it really was the mutations that are responsible for the changes in product profiles we see up here. So and then as the final topic, I want to talk about um, cineal synthesis. So um, like I said before, what's really unusual usual about this enzyme is that it's capable of producing 95% pure cineal, uh, cineal products, what is what we think of as a sort of complex cyclization cascade with many, many opportunities for branching. So there's, again, the initial ionization, what we see in, in all the terpene, monoterpene synthases, followed by the isomerization and cyclization. And that's from, from this sort of cyclic, first cyclic intermediate, um, the next really critical step on the pathway to cineol is this reaction with water. So um, the alpha terpen, terpenol cation undergoes water attack and this alpha terpeniol intermediate is formed which can then undergo a second cyclization to form 95% pure um, cineol. So what happens in the plant enzyme is that we only get about 60% cineol and the rest is these premature products that deviate from, from this alpha terpenol cation. So and we were, were interested to know um, how this bacterial enzyme does that. So again, we were lucky because we've got the crystal structure. And one of the things that was quite obvious is that there's um, a water molecule quite close to the C7 of the GPP analog, um, sort of in perfect position to, to catalyze this water attack. And this water molecule is being held in place by two asparagine residues, um, asparagine 305 and asparagine 220. So again, we made some mutations to see if, if this residue was important. We mutated the enzyme, the protein to a disposition to an alanine, a cysteine, an aspartate, a glutamine and a leucine. And besides that, all of them show, appear to be less active than wild type protein. The most interesting thing is that none of these variants were able to catalyze this um, reaction with water. All of these products are redirected from the alpha terpenol cation. 
And um, to understand um, how this is happening, we um, teamed up with um, the computational chemistry group of Professor Adrian Mulholland in uh, the University of Bristol, who did some um, MD simulations for us on the ternary GPP complexes um, to investigate this further. So here you can see um, the histograms of the distances between C7 of GPP and the oxygen of the closest water molecule. And these were done in 100 nanosecond MD simulations. So for the wild type enzyme, we can see a really nice, clear and sharp peak at about 3.5 angstroms. Um, but we see peak broadening happening for the aspartate and glutamine variants. And what's also interesting is that the water molecule that is closest to the C7 in these variants, it's not always coordinated by the aspartase of glutamine. So what seems to happen is that the water just is often not being activated. And for the other variants, uh, the peak broadening is, is, is even more, um, it's, it's even worse. So it looks like the water network is disrupted in all of these variants and the enzyme is just not capable of um, doing the hydroxylation reaction. So the final thing we looked at is, um, now that we knew that this asparagine residue was really important for the water attack in the bacterial sinial synthase, we compared this enzyme, this structure with um, a known structure of a plant sinial synthase, which is from Greek sage, but also an asparagine residue was implicated in the reaction with water. But when we overlaid the structure of these two enzymes, we found that these residues were actually positioned on opposite sides of the active site. I think that is possible that uh, these two enzymes produce um, Cineol via a different enantiomeric intermediate. So even though cineol itself is achiral, the products are absolutely identical. Um, there's two pathways how to get there via the R and S intermediate. So what we did is um, we did some chiral GC analysis um, of the alpha terpineol byproducts. So in this figure here on the left, I've ran some alpha terpineol standards. In blue, it's the S isomer, and in red, we can see the R isomer. And then here on this figure on the right are the byproducts produced by the bacterial enzyme in blue and the plant enzyme in red and orange. And even though both enzymes accumulate both isomers, the plant enzyme preferentially accumulates the R isomer, and it does this with about 60% of total um, alpha terpineol. And the bacterial enzyme indeed preferentially accumulates the other isomer, the S isomer. But again, it does it at um, a much higher amount of the total, so it's over 90%. So again, it seems like the bacterial enzyme is able to produce cineol via um, a very strict, strictly controlled um, pathway. So to quickly summarize, um, we established a platform for the production of monoterpenoids in E. coli. We were able to produce over 30 different products using 20 uh, enzymes from plant origin. However, titers were often low due to poor protein expression and we obtained product mixtures due to high levels of functional plasticity. So we turned our attention to bacterial enzymes and found that uh, these enzymes are more robust. Um, they seem to express better and therefore result in higher product titers and also cleaner product titers when expressed in our production platform. We were able to solve the crystal structures of the linalool and cineal synthase, which then served as the basis for um, protein engineering. So we, we, we made, um, or we generated an improved um, linalool neurolidol synthase. Um, the native enzyme is able to produce a thousand fold increase in product titers when expressed in E. coli. However, neurolidol is produced as an unwanted byproduct. Uh, we identified these two residues, leucine 72 and valine 214, which are important for substrate selection for this enzyme, and the leucine 72 methionine valine 214 isoleucine double variant produces nearly pure linalool. And then for the um, bacterial cineal synthase, the reaction cascade is really tightly controlled. Again, we saw improved product titers and purity when expressed in our engineered E. coli strain, and we found that product hydros Hydroxylation is, um, which is a critical step in the reaction cascade, is controlled by um, this single asparagine residue, and cineal production occurs almost exclusively via this S alpha terpineol intermediate. Um, and before I end, I would like to thank um, past and present members of the MIB terpene team um, who've all helped in various ways over the last couple of years. Um, we had a long standing collaboration with the computational chemistry group of Professor Adrian Mulholland at the University of Bristol. I'd like to thank my current colleagues at the Future Biomanufacturing 
Biomanufacturing Research Hub and Symbiochem, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for uh, for your uh, exciting talk. Uh, Anthony, are there any questions online? Yeah, thanks very much, Nicole. That was really, really nice talk. So we've got a question uh, from Joshua Whitehead. So it says, do, do you think the promiscuity of the plant uh, TSS is because plants can usually make use of more, more of the different terpene compounds? Um, hi, Josh. Josh, thanks for the question. Yeah, I think it is because um, it, it's really beneficial for the plant to be able to make multiple products from a single enzyme. Um, so I think that these enzymes in the plant do have evolved to, to have this functionality, to have a, a mutation and be able to produce slightly different um, products. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's the case. Okay, so we have a, a question from Tristan uh, Durand. Uh, this is an earlier slide. You showed that there is an enormous diversity of terpene synthases that can be mined from bacterial genomes. Instead of engineering enzymes, could you bioprospect for one that nature has already optimized for the desired GPP versus F FPP specificity? Um, yeah, I think that there's, there's an enormous wealth of genes out there that we don't know what they do. So there's got to be enzymes out there that do exactly what we want. Uh, the problem with terpene synthesis though, is that you can't predict what they're producing based on protein sequence alone. Um, Certainly uh, in plant enzymes, you find that two enzymes from the same species that catalyze different reactions have a higher percentage of sequence identity than two enzymes that catalyze the same reaction from different species. So it's because of this um, sort of very hydrophobic actosite that um, it's really difficult to predict. And this is something we're actually looking into at the moment um, to try and be able to predict from the sequence alone what, what an enzyme does. Because other than that, you'd have to sort of express them all and see what the, what the products are. Okay, so I think Anya, you had a question, is that right? Uh, yes, uh, Nico, also I have a question about the future of biomanufacturing. Um, as the synthetic biology and biocatalysis converge, what do you think the future is? Will we be making these molecules in in vitro cascades now that you have access to enzymes, would it be easier to control the product by just uh, using um, individual enzymes rather than working in E. coli and, and fight the fluxes? Um, that's, that's a really difficult question to answer uh, because I've been talking about just the terpene synthesis in this talk, but there's about 10, 15 other enzymes that act before the terpene synthesis to be able to make the terpenoids. Um, to do all of that in a cascade, um, I don't know. I guess it really, really depends on, on what the product is that you want to make. Um, so one of the things that we're actually doing in, in the future BRH is, is adopt a, a sort of hybrid approach where we use synthetic biology to sort of produce bulk platform chemicals in higher amounts and then take these forward in a more biocap approach to sort of decorate and fine tune um, these products. So maybe that, that's where the future is going. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. We see a lot of uh, activities in a cannabinoid world uh, where, where a lot of those in vitro cascades are being constructed. So, um, so, so yeah, we will be curious to see about the commodity chemicals, uh, how, how that turns out. Mm, yeah. Thank you. There is one more question that's just come in. So uh, from Tyler Coleman, um, is toxicity of GPP and the monoterpene a significant issue? Yes, um, we think it is. Um, we know that monoterpenes are toxic to bacteria and, and therefore E. coli because they're used in cleaning products, etc. cetera. Um, I think that certainly for um, linalool production, we are reaching toxicity levels. So it's becoming an issue. And we're trying to work our way around that by, by engineering the bug and making it more resistant to, to these compounds. So yeah, it, it, it is an issue.